This is a very interesting interview, Dr. Craig, between Sam Harris and Jerry Coyne. Regular listeners to Reasonable Faith will know who these gentlemen are. If, uh, if you're not as familiar with them, Sam Harris is considered one of the four horsemen of the new atheism, mm -hmm. very instrumental in that new atheist movement. Jerry Coyne, professor of biology, University of Chicago. Uh, uh, his, his articles are in the press quite often. He's got a new book out called Fact Versus Faith. Sam Harris interviews him on his blog concerning this. And what we're going to hear today are a bunch of, of uh, issues dealing with science and religion, um, the notion of free will, and some other things, Bill. So we, we want to go through these and do a couple of podcasts on them. Many people are listening to this interview and are pointing us to it. And mm -hmm. I can see why that they, they did this. You've had interaction with Sam Harris. Right. We had a debate at the University of Notre Dame put on by the Center for Philosophy of Religion there on the foundation of moral values. So I have had a chance to meet him personally and interact with his views. Coyne I have not met, uh, nor have I interacted with his work. What we're going to do is go through this piece by piece, and from time to time um, you will stop us when you want to, to comment or make a point, and we'll go through this, uh, this interview. Um, I think that our listeners are going to find this fascinating. Let's begin. Right. Well, the thing you focus on in the, in the new book is this phenomenon that uh, we've come to call accommodationism. Can you explain what that is? And, and do you know, did, did, you, did you coin this word? Where did this word come from? Coin is a good, <laughs> good verb for that. Um, I think I did, but I'm not sure. You know, it's one of those words that I use a lot, and I think people got from me, but I'm not sure I'm the originator of it. So since I don't know that, I'm not going to claim credit for that neologism. But, you know, it is a good one, and people have picked it up. In terms of what it means, it's a view that is held by both believers agnostics and you know atheists themselves sometimes that there is no inherent conflict or any kind of conflict between science and religion um, there are various ways that you can ca um, couch that compatibility thing but that's basically the view that there is no conflict between the two areas and was the first clear and clearly wrong-headed expression of this uh, Stephen Jay Gould's non-overlapping magisteria. Where do we get this notion of, of fundamental compatibility? Yeah, actually, he's the guy that made it famous, but I think I have actually the book here. I can find the first expression of it. In 1925, by Alfred North Whitehead, um, I just have a quote from him here that says that, remember the widely different aspects of events which are dealt with in science and religion, respectively. Science is concerned with the general conditions which are observed to regulate physical phenomena, whereas religion is wholly wrapped up in the contemplation of moral and aesthetic values. On the one side, there is the law of gravitation, and on the other, the contemplation of the beauty of holiness. What one side sees, the other misses, and vice versa. So that's Whitehead in 1925, mm -hmm. anticipated by 74 years, um, saying basically the same thing, that it's the separate magisteria view. Gould, of course, made the view famous because he was a famous scientist. The public left up his works. And he wrote a whole book on this, what he calls the NOMA, or non-overlapping magisteria hypothesis. Plus, everybody loved the idea, you know, why can't we all get along? That's a very popular idea. You can't be wrong if you say something like that. And, um, you know, it, it was a famous book. But, you know, you see this kind of view of non-overlapping magisteria scattered throughout the discussion of science and religion, you know, throughout the uh, 20th century. Just to be clear about what non-overlapping magisteria are, it's, it's a, the idea is that there are these two domains of expertise that are separate, and one is the purview of religion, the other is the purview of science, and they, they don't overlap. So in principle, there can be no conflict between science and religion. That's correct, because I mean, it's like a Venn diagram with two circles that don't intersect, so there's no overlap. Yeah. I mean, I think Gould was badly wrong about that, but that was his thesis. One sphere, just to be clear, is the domain of investigating what's real in the universe, and the other domain, Gould said, was the bailiwick of meaning, morals, and values, which is the religious circle. Yeah, this is, I, I just 
can never understand why this idea has a half-life of more than like 90 seconds among <laughs> smart people. So, because clearly, clearly every religion is making claims about certain invisible things and certain ultimate fates really existing. Dr. Craig, surely you remember Nomo from Stephen Jay Gould. I remember people on both sides didn't like it because people on the religion side didn't like to be relegated to fuzziness and, and, and not being factual. And uh, people on the, uh, on the scientific side said, well, you know, we're not just about hardcore facts. Mm -hmm. But uh, what do you think about their well, uh, observations? Well, I think that these kinds of labels paint with far too broad a brush and show an insensitivity to comparative religions. Some religions, such as Christianity, certainly do overlap with um, scientific knowledge of the world and what it claims about the way the world is. But other religions, for example, pantheistic religions like Hinduism or Taoism or Confucianism, are not clearly in uh, overlapping with, with science because they're not talking about verifiable realities that um, intersect with, with the world. Think of Confucianism, for example, which is just about, as they say, moral values and conduct of one's life. So I think they're painting here with far too broad a brush. You need to be more discriminating about which religion you're talking about when you ask the question, does that religion make factual claims about the world? Some do and some don't. Sam Harris continues here saying that, in fact, um, religion in general does make claims about reality. People and souls and various corners of the cosmos, there are invisible spirits, there are souls, there are gods, there's a hell you can go to or successfully avoid. These are all claims about the way the universe is and how someone like Gould could think they don't trespass on the terrain of science. Uh, I can't even begin to see how this confusion is arising in someone like him. I think this book is a bit disingenuous. This illustrates the point that I'm making. He's obviously speaking here out of a Christian Western tradition, but Buddhism, for example, doesn't make any claim that there's a soul. It, it doesn't believe in souls. It doesn't believe in the afterlife. Um, so you, you need more sensitivity to comparative religions when you try to assign these labels. He probably has Christianity in mind. Uh, I, I think that's pretty clear. When he talks about doctrine of hell and things of that sort, he, he, he's clearly thinking of the Western Christian tradition. Anyways, I knew Steve. He was on my thesis committee, and he was a diehard atheist, if there ever was one. I don't know if this book was like a psychological burp in him or that it was a, a gambit to gain popularity with the public. I, I just find it hard to believe knowing Steve. I mean, he's you know passed on now that he would really believe this. <laughs> but, you know, when faced okay. with the Who's he talking about? Stephen J. Gould. He can't believe that. Okay. He, okay. You know, argument you made, that, which I agree with 100%, that almost all religions, there may be a few outliers, make statements about what is real in the universe. Gould would claim that that's not real religion. So, for example, creationism, which is a staple of Christianity in the United States and is accepted by f about 43% of all Americans, young earth creationism, is a tenet of Protestantism, of many Protestants, and that's a claim about the real world. I mean, Genesis talks about it, basically how old the earth is, if you calculate it back. It talks about everything being formed at once. It makes statements about Noah's flood. All of these things are not only scientific statements, but they're scientifically checkable. So, you know, what Gould did when faced with that is he said, well, that's not real science. I mean, sorry, that's not real religion. That's, uh, I don't rem even remember what he calls it. I talk about it in my book. But he finessed the problem by just defining a way as not religious, those statements that religion makes about reality. And so, of course, you know, tautologically he was correct, but it doesn't make sense. And theologians have uh, glommed on to this evasive maneuver he made. Now, that, you know, in some circles, it's still popular to deny that religion does not make statements about reality. There was an article by Tanya Lerman in last Sunday's New York Times 
referring to another paper by a, uh, I think, a Belgian philosopher who claims that religious statements of fact aren't the same as the kind of fact that we think of when we say there's a table here or, you know, the earth is 10,000 years old. They're what he calls statements of religious credence. They don't have the same factual or epistemic content as factual statements. So there's a whole lot of so-called sophisticated religious people who... What do you think about that? Theory. Well, I think it's very clear that creationism is an example, especially young earth creationism, of a religious worldview that makes factual claims about the physical world. And by contrast, he's quite right in pointing out that a good number of what one might call neoliberal theologians um, uh, advocate a view of religion which doesn't make any sort of factual claims about the world. Indeed, in the aftermath of logical positivism and verificationism during the 1930s and 40s, liberal theologians seemed ready to say that um, religious statements don't make factual claims, but that these are expressions of, for example, one's absolute dependence upon the God or um, that these might be emotive expressions of the beauty and the grandeur of the world or one's gratitude for living or something. So that's certainly true that um, a good number of modern uh, neoliberal theologians would hold to a, a view of religion which um, claims that religion doesn't make scientific factual claims. And it's odd that Coyne would recognize that because that contradicts the point that he and Harris were making that religion isn't a non-overlapping view. Now he's recognizing that for many modern liberal theologians it is such a position. So that's a little well, bit inconsistent. They're cr critiquing that position. They, they think that that's, um, that's, that's fudging. They think that uh, that is being inconsistent. Uh, but how is it inconsistent for a liberal theologian who believes what I just said yeah. to say that science and religion are non-overlapping domains? It seems to me that given his liberal views, that's perfectly consistent. It's inconsistent with, say, creationism or, I think, biblical Christianity, but it's not inconsistent with liberal theology. I mean, as I say, this is a direct contradiction to what they said before, that religion makes factual claims that science can verify, and now they're recognizing that in the minds of many neoliberal theologians, that is not the case. They interpret religion in the same way that Stephen Jay Gould does. So you've got to uh, show some reason to think that these folks are wrong. You can't say they're inconsistent. Take a different tack from Gould and claim that religion is not about factual statements at all. And, you know, I would take issue with that, and I assume you would too. So, you know, they too would sign on with Noma. But most theologians have rejected Steve's statement because, just on this, the religious side, because they recognize that their own faith makes claims about reality. To take Christianity as the example, if you think that Jesus really existed, you're making a claim about. A historical person so, and if you think that he really survived his death and in some sense persists and can hear your prayers and that he may be coming back to earth to raise the dead in turn you're making claims about biology you're making claims about the hu human survival of death you're making claims about telepathic powers of a now invisible carpenter you're making very likely claims about human flight without the aid of technology yep I mean, it's, it's, it's very frustrating and this is the as you Thing. Again, he's obviously correct that for those who hold that the resurrection of Jesus is a literal event of history, as we do, we are making factual claims that can in some measure be verified or falsified. Suggested also related to the idea that many people have that religious beliefs don't actually lead to any significant human behavior in this world because religious beliefs are in principle vacuous and they're only about solidarity and community and finding this sort of nebulous meaning in life. They don't actually lead to concrete behaviors 
that we need to worry about. So jihadism is not the result of what any specific Muslims believe. It's politics, it's, it's economics. And so religious belief is not worth worrying about. This is one of his main complaints, Bill, uh, Sam Harris, that religion is off limits and should be immune socially and polite company to criticism. And he's now, going, I don't think that that was, I know he makes that point, mm -hmm. Kevin, but I don't think that was the point he was making here. Okay. I think what he's saying here is that you can't ignore religion on the basis of the view that it's irrelevant and doesn't affect human behavior. And that's obviously correct, even given the Whiteheadian view that they talked about earlier, that religion is only about moral and aesthetic values, not about factual claims. If religion is not about factual claims, as neoliberal theologians think, but is really about moral and aesthetic values, well, obviously that's going to affect your behavior. You will uh, guide your life by the ethical code that you've adopted. You will have an appreciation for beauty and art uh, that you perhaps would not have held otherwise. So clearly, religion is going to motivate and affect a person's behavior, whether it intersects with science or not. Mm -hmm. And as we're going to hear in a moment, he says, and obviously that's going to affect public policy and the society in, in, in which we live. It's an attitude that many of our fellow atheists hold, and that therefore they have, they see no reason to oppose people's religious certainties, even when they're seeming to encroach in the public sphere, in, in the kinds of public policies that uh, members of our own government want to enact. They continually doubt that religion is at the bottom of those policies, whether it's opposition to gay marriage or embryonic stem cell research or whatever it is in, in the context of the United States. And I find it incredibly frustrating to interact with this kind of denialism, which is the other side of, of what you're calling accommodationism. Yeah, it's interesting. There's actually two claims there. The first one is that religion does not make any meaningful statements about reality. And the second claim, which could be separate from that, is that religious beliefs don't lead to behavior. I mean, those things don't, aren't necessarily connected with one another. But it would be an interesting exercise to see if those people who claim that religious beliefs don't have epistemic content are the same people who deny that, you know, for example, belief in the Quran leads to suicide bombing. I'm sure, I think somebody like Karen Armstrong would instantiate both of those views. Yeah, she has yeah. this apophatic view of religion that you can't say anything about God. And of course, she goes around and claims that everything that bad that religious people do is not based on religion themselves. So. You know. Yeah. Well, Scott Atran, the, the uh, anthropologist, has linked those two ideas very explicitly in the way he talks about Islam, that these beliefs, religious beliefs, are uh, in principle vacuous. They have no propositional content about the world that could motivate anybody to do anything differently, and therefore nobody does anything differently on their basis, i.e. nobody blows himself up for that reason. I think that we need to surface here, Kevin, an assumption that is lying below the surface, and that is that claims about ethical and moral values are somehow not objective truths about the world. There is a kind of subterranean scientism that's lurking here, where the only factual claims one is making about the world are verifiable scientific claims, and that when neoliberal theologians make ethical and aesthetic judgments on the basis of religion, they're not really making um, claims that have any objective truth value. Now, that may be true for some of them, but it's not necessarily true for all. Those who would reject uh, scientism could well see themselves as making objective truth claims about the world, even though they wouldn't be scientific in nature. Yeah, I was going to say, I think we had something like a bit of this conversation when you were here in Chicago last time. I would like to ask those people, okay, what would it take to convince you that they really were motivated by religion? I mean, they're like theologians in a way that there's nothing you can tell them to disabuse them or no evidence whatsoever that would convince them that they're being motivated by religion because they can always think of a way that it's something else. I think it's 
evident that Muslims can be motivated to carry out jihad because of the teachings of their religion. As I have said publicly on more than one occasion, Islam is a religion that enjoins violence and was in fact historically propagated by violence in the support of religion. By contrast, the ethics of Jesus motivate a very different kind of behavior when followed consistently because he taught that you should love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, do good to those who use you, uh, and so forth. So it's a very different ethic in Christianity than in Islam. And so obviously, these differing religions will have a polar opposite impact upon one's behavior. It makes it all the more uh, wrong then to lump religion into this one big orb. Yeah, it's, it? it's so obvious that these fellows here have not made any serious attempt to study the various religions of the world and to really understand them because this painting with the broad brush, lumping everything together, is just not useful in talking about the impact of different religions upon human behavior and the kinds of claims that they make about the world. So I'd like to ask them to write down a list of, okay, what would it take you to show that, I mean, I saw your um, interchange with Tron, I guess it was in 2006, I read that yesterday, and I was simply astounded that he could say the things he did about you know, I mean, and then you showed a video of a Muslim preacher reciting from the Quran, and you said it was very moving. And I looked at that, and it was. The words were beautiful. The musicality was great. And he was talking about hellfire and how, you know, yeah. and people were weeping. You know, it's hard to believe yeah, that, yeah. that any kind of re emotional reaction like that could not be caused by belief in the propositions that the preacher is actually laying out at the time. It wasn't the music that was making him cry. <laughs> It was the fact right, that they were right. part of this great movement of belief. So I think to anybody who's not blinkered by some kind of accommodationist desires, it's palpably obvious that so much behavior is motivated by religious belief. I mean, look at creationists. If they don't really believe in the tenets of Genesis, why are they trying to force them to be taught to everybody in schools? Why are they opposing evolution if it's just some kind of, you know, metaphor that they see in Genesis? I don't think that's the case. I think they really do believe that the words of Genesis are true, and that's borne out by polls that show that a substantial proportion of Americans take the Bible as literal truth. Yeah, and you, and you made in that conversation in Chicago the very useful observation, which I have now reiterated many times, which is this is a double standard that people like Tran and Armstrong and, and everyone else has not copped to, because they never ask that we justify uh, or that we doubt the political or economic rationales put forward for human behavior. Yep. So for instance, when someone like a, a member of the KKK says, I'm doing all this stuff because I hate black people, you know, I'm really a racist and this is my core political ideology, nobody doubts that racist hatred of black people is really motivating this person. We would never try to look for an underlying motive there that negates the claim that he is in fact really racist. But when we have someone expressing their religious opinions or the religious expectations, the idea that they're going to get into paradise behaving a certain way, or the idea that, that homosexuality is anathema to God, the accommodationists insist upon finding some layer below that which is the true reason why a person is behaving as he is. Yeah. You know where else I see this same phenomenon occurring, Kevin? It's with atheists themselves, when you point out that atheism is a sort of religion and that this religion has been responsible for untold millions of deaths and suffering in the world, from monsters like Stalin to Mao Zedong. And what the atheist will typically say in response to that is, oh, well, they're not motivated by their atheism. It's They'll not also really that, their atheism that caused them to do yeah. that. It's these deeper issues. They do exactly the same thing that Coyne and Harris are accusing religious believers of doing. Yeah. Confirmation bias. I mean, theologians behave the same way. You know, they'll 
accept evidence that substantiates their religious beliefs, but anything that goes against it, they, you know, they reject or work it into their, you know, worldview somehow. Um, these accommodationists in terms of politics and religion. Again, it's just useful to remind ourselves that what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, and that atheisms can su atheists can suffer from this same confirmation bias too, seeing the evidence that they like confirming their worldview, but then ignoring any evidence that might cut against it. That, that is also something that atheists need to be conscious of. So it cuts both ways. It cuts both ways. Or exactly the same way, and I can't help but believe that this is just one more symptom of the unwarranted respect that people have for religion and faith. They just cannot bring themselves to claim that religion could make yeah. anybody yeah. do anything bad. I mean, if people like us can admit that religion can sometimes make people do good, I don't see why they can't admit the same thing on their side. Yeah. No, no, wait, why, why, why are we focusing on bad? If religion motivates people to do good, then religion does affect human behavior, as Coyne and Harris say. Mm -hmm. But why are they focusing on bad behavior? It seems to me that we can say that uh, religion can have a leavening effect upon culture that can bring about tremendous goods. And that would equally refute the view that religion is irrelevant and doesn't affect behavior. It can affect it for great good. They seem to be critiquing the left and neoliberalism for saying that uh, this is why you can't criticize religion because they don't really mean it. It's, it's, it's something else a little more nebulous. And yeah, I think that they're not only criticizing maybe the neoliberal person, but they're going after their own in-house atheists and agnostics who are, in their view, insufficiently aggressive and insufficiently critical. I mean, look at the inordinate amount of time they've spent in this interview attacking a view that virtually no biblical Christian would agree with, namely that religion is irrelevant and doesn't make factual claims. Why are they spending so much time on this unless this is an in-house problem for the non-theist and therefore they feel obliged to address it? And let's uh, put a finer point on that, because I, I freely admit that religion can cause people to do extraordinary things which are good, and many of which could be unthinkable, but for uh, that specific person's religious beliefs. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible that there are people who would only go to Africa to aid in a famine because of what they believe about Jesus and about the importance of spreading his word. Okay, in fairness then, it's, it's good to see that they do recognize that, and uh, I don't want it to make it look as though we've overlooked this point. They hadn't made that point up to now, but now they have. And that those same people couldn't find a truly rational, secular motive to behave that way. It's not to say that the rational, secular motives don't exist, but for any one person, it's quite possible that he's not going to get out of bed in the morning and do good, but for believing certain irrational things about God or about his fate after death. That's totally possible, and there seems no reason to deny that. Yeah, that's another example of the double standard. I mean, if we can admit that religion is such a psychological motivator, that it will drive missionaries to places that are, well, God-forsaken in both <laughs> respects, and sacrifice basically their well-being and their lives to do this kind of stuff, why do they deny that it could also motivate people to do things that we consider bad, but they consider good for their religion. I don't really understand the whole thing, except that the people that usually do that show this overweening respect for faith. Yeah, now so what do you make of someone like Francis Collins? Because obviously one argument that we hear for the compatibility between science and religion is essentially an existence proof in the person of, uh, of someone like Francis Collins. So here you have a scientist who is a working scientist who is in fact in Collins's case, an evangelical Christian. So there it is, proof that science and religion are compatible. And he says that they're not only compatible, but, but mutually supportive. What do you make of the, the, the yeah. riddle of his, of his mind? Well, there's two claims there. The first one is compatibility. The second is mutual support. Um, I would take the second one first and say that that's 
not true at all. If you look at what science does to religion, it doesn't support it because it never substantiates the claims of religion. The history of science's incursion into religion is simply to whittle away its truth claims to you know almost nothing. So if you, I don't know how anybody can claim that science supports religion these days, except maybe for the claim that Collins makes that I'll talk about in a minute. Do you know? Okay, let's hear what that claim is. Eh? In terms of religion helping science, oh, okay. for, he doesn't um, say it doesn't, yet what it is. Well, obviously, Kevin, this will depend upon whether or not arguments based upon the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, the origin of life, the complexity of the biological world, and so on and so forth are, are good arguments, and that needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, these fellows aren't convinced. I am convinced of some of those arguments. Uh, let's have a debate about it. Do anything. As Laplace said, you know, we do not need that hypothesis anymore. Collins, when he enters his laboratory, to do work, or I presume supervise his sequencers, does, leaves God at the door. You don't get anywhere in science by assuming that there's any kind of divine or numinous reality. Now what he's talking about here is that the working scientist assumes methodological naturalism. Even a theist like Collins, when he goes into the laboratory, is going to be looking for natural causes. But the assumption of methodological naturalism makes no metaphysical claim whatsoever. This is merely a methodology that one has adopted in doing one's professional work, and, it, and therefore it, it cuts no metaphysical mustard at all. The way I have expressed the support which science might lend to theistic belief is not to say that science proves God or that you introduce God as a hypothesis into a scientific theory. The way I put it is this. Science can provide evidence in support of a premise in a philosophical argument leading to a conclusion that has theological significance. Let me repeat that. Science can provide evidence in support of a premise in a philosophical argument leading to a conclusion that has theological significance. So take, for example, the Kalam cosmological argument. Um, if the universe began to exist, the universe has a transcendent cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a transcendent cause. Now science can provide good evidence for the second premise, that the universe began to exist. That is a theologically neutral statement that can be found in any textbook on astronomy and astrophysics, and I think that the scientific evidence goes to support that. And that in turn serves as a premise in a philosophical argument leading to a conclusion that is, I think, pregnant with theological significance, namely there is a transcendent cause of the universe. So it's not a matter of introducing God as a hypothesis into science or of upending methodological naturalism, it's simply saying that science can provide evidence that supports a premise in an argument that leads to a theologically significant conclusion. What are the philosophical uh, ramifications or inferences of raw scientific data, right? I mean, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be as well? You have uh, calculations in science, you have discoveries in science, it's a philosophical question as well. Uh, what the inferences are, what that infers, what that points to. Yes, you know, this is interesting, Kevin, because I think that these fellows do fail to realize that there's another dialogue partner here, a kind of silent partner that's being ignored. And that is that in addition to science and theology, there is philosophy. Mm -hmm. And it will be philosophy that tends to be, I think, the mediator between science and theology by doing what you just suggested, drawing out implications and ramifications of purely scientific work that then might be theologically significant. And by ignoring that mediator philosophy, it makes the gap between science and religion look unbridgeable in the minds of these gentlemen. I can do both, or that there's a lot of religious people who are friendly to science, or a lot of religious scientists 
which is, and all of that is true. To me, that just shows a form of compartmentalization rather than compatibility, that people can have two divergent worldviews in their head at the same time and, and somehow manage to live as a unified person in okay. that way. <laughs> I think that's incredibly condescending, Kevin. Um, when you look at the writings of famous scientists who are also theists, like George Ellis, Christopher Isham, Donald Page, um, Francis Collins, I think it's really insulting to say, well, this is just evidence of compartmentalization on Rather the part of these people. Yeah. These folks, I think, would all probably reject the non-overlapping magisteria view, and they would see their science and theology as integrated together. So these folks don't adhere to the view that Harris and Coyne are rejecting, the non-overlapping magisteria view, and therefore it's, it's, I think, just inaccurate as well as insulting to suggest that these persons don't see science and theology as parts of an integrated worldview. Christians generally say you shouldn't have this kind of compartmentalism in your life. I once heard a youth specialist say that youth, uh, they said, this is my faith, these are my beliefs, but this is my life. Uh, this is my girlfriend, uh, but this is, these are my beliefs, and the, the two will not meet. And I go to church on Sunday uh, to the belief museum to visit my beliefs, <laughs> but during the week, you know, I, I, I leave those at the museum. Yeah, as I say, the biblical Christian will be agreeing, by and large, with what Coyne and Harris have said so far, that religion and, and science have overlapping areas of interest, uh, that religion is highly relevant and can motivate behavior for good or for ill. Um, there's very little to disagree with here so far from a biblical point of view. I deal with this and these other specious claims of uh, compatibility in the book. But my response to Collins would be, well, Catholicism and pedophilia are compatible because there's a fair number of Catholic priests who are pedophiles, <laughs> and they don't think there's anything wrong with that. Well, that's compartmentalization. Okay. That's yeah. I mean, I said before it was condescending and insulting. This is positively outrageous to compare Francis Collins' views on science and theology to pedophile priests who don't see the incompatibility between their religious beliefs and abuse of children. This is, this is outrageous. And he owes an apology to Collins for these kind of comments. So showing that one person instantiates two sort of conflicting views is not for me an argument in compatibility. Or if you want to be a little less invidious, you can say, Science and creationism are compatible because, after all, there are some scientists who are creationists. Not a lot, but there are some. You know? So, to me, that's an argument for compartmentalization and not compatibility. I mean, my view is not that you can hold both views at the same time as an example of compatibility, but that the two spheres approach their ways of finding truth in completely different manners. And that's what I define as compatibility how you seek and find out what's real in the universe. Right. Well, now, wait a minute. More. Wait, wait a minute here, Kevin. Is he suggesting that compatibility implies that the way you seek and discover truth is the same in all disciplines? If that is his claim, that's obviously false. Someone who's doing mathematics, for example, isn't going to follow the same kind of methodology as the experimental physicist or the biologist. And somebody who's doing ethics or aesthetics or even, say, literary criticism or history is going to follow different methodologies that are appropriate for that discipline. And it would be outrageously naive to think that there is one sort of method that you can superimpose over every discipline so as to say that because this isn't a scientific methodology, therefore, this discipline doesn't get at truth or make objective truth claims about reality. About that, so what really is the conflict between religion and science as methodologies and ways of arriving at truth claims? Well, I have it all summed up in this aphorism I like to use, which is that in science, 
faith is a vice and in religion it's a virtue. In science, faith is a vice and... And in religion, okay. <laughs> it's, faith is a virtue. Okay. <laughs> Kevin, this is almost, it, it's, it's almost funny. The very differentiation between vices and virtues is a philosophical, not a scientific, distinction. And science is fraught with uh, assumptions that cannot be proven scientifically. Um, so that faith is operative in science um, in many different ways uh, in terms of uh, belief in the validity of inductive reasoning, in belief in the laws of logic, in belief in mathematics, in the ethical values that guide scientific research and reporting, in the belief that we are uh, able to have knowledge of an external world rather than merely an illusion. Um, it, is, it is outrageously naive to think that science operates without faith. He defines faith here. Okay. Let's listen. Say, say more about that. So what really is the conflict between religion and science as methodologies and ways of arriving at truth claims? Well, I have it all summed up in this aphorism I like to use, which is that in science, faith is a vice, and in religion, it's a virtue. It basically comes down to faith. I mean, that's why I call my book Faith Versus Fact. It's about religion and science, but religion is basically the most widespread instantiation of faith, which is belief without evidence sufficient to convince any reasonable person. Okay. What do you do with people who are so blind to what religious thinkers actually believe so as to impose these caricatures on them? This sounds like um, the definition of faith from the miracle on 34th Street, where faith is believing in something that you don't have any evidence for. That's not the way your typical Christian, at least, will define faith. Faith is not a way of knowing something. Faith is trusting in something that you have good reason to believe is true. And as such, there is no conflict between faith and science, because if you have good reason to believe something is true, then you can repose your faith, your confidence, your trust in it. And science is the most exquisite example of fact, which is, you know, how to find out what's real in the universe. Let me say a, a few words about why we even talk about science and religion. We don't talk about why religion and sports are compatible or why religion and business are compatible. And that's not a question that people worry about, but they worry about religion and science being compatible. Now, why is that? It wait, is wait, because... I, but I don't think that's true, do you, Kevin? I mean, I think people do want, they are interested in integrative studies between theology and ethics, theology and philosophy, th theology and sport, even, uh, theology and economics, business. I, I think these fellows are just naive about the sort of work that's being done in these other disciplines where one looks for an integrative view of, of the world. So certainly the interface between science and religion is enormously important given the importance of science and discovering the way the physical world looks as well as its cultural influence. But it is far from the only discipline or field where people are interested in the intersection of theology or religion with that field. Both of those areas, as we've just discussed, make claims about reality. And any theologian worth his or her salt is going to admit that. You mentioned some of those realities, you know, Jesus, the resurrection, the afterlife, hell, and things like that. So, in a way, religion is a science in that it makes claims about reality and it has hypotheses. But it's a pseudoscience because when 
its way of finding out what's real, its way of substantiating its claims, is based on faith, authority, dogma. It's not the same method that scientists use when they test their claims. So the basic conflict is when you make a claim about what's real, how do you find out whether that claim is true or not? I think the truth in what Coyne is saying is that religion or theology recognizes other ways of getting at truth, other ways of knowing things than simply through scientific methodology. But that's also true, for example, of the metaphysician, the ethicist, the aesthetic uh, philosopher, um, the logician. Different disciplines have different ways of getting at truth about reality. And I do think that it's possible to gain theological knowledge um, apart from the scientific method. But if one's theology then comes into conflict with science, that doesn't mean that you can just ignore what science has to say on it. On the contrary, this is going to be a potential defeater for your religious beliefs that you will then need to address. But nothing that Coyne has said justifies thinking that the only way to get at truth is through science. Science has its whole toolkit of methods, replication, peer review, all kinds of you know, appeal to nature, testability, and then religion has a whole set of its toolkit, which is based on you know, authorities, consulting ancient scriptures, personal revelation, etc. And they're basically incompatible ways. I mean, science does find out stuff, and religion doesn't. As far as I can see, theology has not progressed in Go ahead and let's hear that. Understanding the nature of the divine, or even if there is a divine, in the past two millennia. Again, Kevin, I, wait a minute. He, he, he hasn't yet demonstrated that science and religion are incompatible. All he's asserted is that they have different methodologies, different ways of getting at truth, but then he, he, he asserts that they're incompatible, and he hasn't shown that yet. Uh, again, that's painting with far too broad... A brush. But then the second claim is the idea that there's no progress in theology, and I think that again just manifests the ignorance of these gentlemen of the field of theology and particularly philosophy of religion, philosophical theology. There has been tremendous progress in that area, particularly over the last uh, half century or so. Just to give a couple of examples, the so-called logical version of the problem of evil, which has been propounded since the time of Epicurus, is now largely regarded as having been solved, that, uh, that one is not able to demonstrate any sort of logical inconsistency between God and the suffering and evil in the world. Um, another example of progress would be in the conception of God and the divine attributes conceptions of God's eternity, of simplicity, of omnipotence, um, of divine necessity and aseity. All of these have received extensive philosophical analysis uh, in recent years that have greatly enriched and advanced our concept of the divine. The renaissance of the ontological argument would be another example of progress that has been made in understanding God and in arguments for the existence of God. So these fellows, I think, are just exhibiting a kind of myopia where as scientists they know their field, but they've exerted very little effort and spent little time trying to understand the field of theology that they're criticizing. Whenever, and I hear people say this a lot, there's no progress, never been any progress in philosophy. Well, if that's true, then that's a philosophical insight, and that's progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because in the you know? past, people always thought that there was. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so at least we have that. So we... that's the basic incompatibility. It's they, they're competing because they make statements about reality, but only one of those branches, science, has a way to find out whether what you say is true. Okay, okay. stop. That shows incompatibility. They make claims about reality 
And science is the only way to test those claims to determine that they're true, and that shows it's incompatible? That, that's just illogical. That doesn't follow at all. It would only be if, as a result of those scientific tests, you were to falsify the religious claims, right? But that's not yet been done, or it hasn't been said in the interview. Suppose as science tests these theological claims and it confirms them that the, the scientific evidence supports the religious claim. Has that then shown incompatibility? Well, obviously not. So even if they were correct that science is the sole means of testing these factual claims made by religion, that doesn't demonstrate incompatibility. It seems to me that only science really focuses on the problem of confirmation bias and wishful thinking and motivated reasoning and all of the other judgment errors we make when we are committed to certain things being true while investigating whether or not they are. It's only in science where you really see the necessity of getting your agenda out of the way uh, and testing to see whether you have fooled yourself. Richard Feynman's famous line that science is the art of, of not fooling yourself and you have I think that's obviously wrong, Kevin, because religions, because they make incompatible claims about reality, have a very strong interest in knowing which religion is making the right claims. Is it Hinduism? Is it Islam? Is it Buddhism? Is it Christianity? Is it atheism? Which, as I say, is a kind of religious worldview. And so um, we will obviously have an interest in confirmation bias and whether or not uh, those who hold to a differing religious view of the world are suffering from it or whether we are. And that will again include the atheist himself. He also needs to ask those same questions about himself. So given the diversity of religious views of the world, there is going to be the same sort of interest in seeing which one is true and if any. To remember that you are the, the easiest person, the person to fool. fool. Right, I love that, that statement. I mean, that encapsulates the nature of the scientific enterprise better than any description of science. I mean, science is basically a set of tools that have been honed by experience to find out what's real. And part of it is you have to brutally eliminate the desire or any kind of manipulation which would help you find what you want to be true or what you believe to be true or what you find emotionally satisfying. And that includes the philosophy of atheism as well. That can be the result of this sort of confirmation bias. What they have- Or scientism. <laughs> yes, or scientism. <laughs> the, the, it, the interview, as it's gone on, Kevin, it, it's become very clear, I think, that what is driving this is a kind of scientism that thinks that science is the only way to get at truth, and that therefore any field of inquiry that is not science such as mathematics, logic, aesthetics, metaphysics, ethics, theology, that all of these um, are spurious. This is really little more than the old logical positivism and verificationism of the 1930s and 40s, which is now recognized universally in philosophy as untenable, as a, uh, an obsolete and unsupportable epistemology, and yet, these fellows, I think, are presupposing this sort of scientistic view in, um, in what they're saying. And in terms of extolling the value of science and uh, seeing it as such a valuable tool and getting it the way the physical world is, we will agree with them 100% on that. But that doesn't mean that all truth is scientific truth and that there are not truths that can be known and arrived at through means that are non-scientific. Religion, on the other hand, is, I mean, it's precisely the opposite. It's set up to help you fool yourself, to give you confirmation bias. If and there's anything that goes against your religion, you somehow either turn it into a metaphor, so it's still there to buttress your religion in some sense, or you just reject the fact, period. So. That's why I call religion a pseudoscience. I mean, in effect, religious people are like, they're not going to like hearing this, but they're like people who claim they were abducted by UFOs 
or people who believe in ESP or telekinesis or conspiracy theorists, they have this view which they find emotionally satisfying. It is a hypothesis about reality, but when it's disconfirmed, they have all these tools that they use to reject that disconfirmation. It's the Again, this is incredibly condescending and insulting to not only great scientists who are theists like uh, Isham and Ellis and Collins and others, but also to great philosophers who are theists like Plantinga and Van Inwagen and Adams and Alston and Swinburne and so many others, as well as theists in other fields. Um, and what he is saying, again, I, I'm repeating myself, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. This is true for the atheist as well, that he can be fooling himself by repressing any evidence that doesn't fit in with his atheistic worldview and only accepting the evidence that he wants to have. And I think you and I have seen atheists doing that all the time when confronted with a theistic argument. I have found that in some cases atheists are willing to accept the most outlandish and absurd beliefs just out of a desire to avoid theism. For example, to believe that the entire universe just popped into being uncaused out of nothing, which is worse than magic. The exact opposite of science. So in many ways, theologians behave exactly like ufologists behave. The, the ways that they reject information that they don't like are very similar. The flip side of that is they use the consoling experience they get from believing certain things as evidence of the truth of those propositions. There's this lack of attention to the difference between believing something because you have good reasons to believe it and believing it because of the way it's being true would make you feel. Yeah, that's the whole um, revelation bit. And I guess that's the subject of, uh, you know, the varieties of religious ex experience, William James's great book, that, you know, the, re the religious experience is a personal experience. You've had a revelation and it's made you feel good. So. Right. Well, it's not All right. That is an utter mischaracterization of William James' view that just again shows their ignorance of the view that they're criticizing. View, uh, pardon me, James was attacking precisely the sort of empiricism and evidentialism that these two fellows are propounding. And what James argued was that in a situation where the evidence is equal and doesn't incline one way or the other, and the decision as to what to believe is momentous, it has a huge impact on your life, it is um, uh, forced upon you, uh, it is urgent, then he says you are perfectly rational to make a decision to believe one of those rather than the other, even though the evidence doesn't propound either way. And I think um, James's argument in, in the will to believe is uh, a, a very good argument, which shows the weakness of the kind of evidentialism that 19th century um, figures like Clifford uh, was advocating. You can have personal experiences that would be evidence of something. They don't equip you to say anything about the universe at large, but you can have a personal experience of you know, a radical change in your life which tells you that something has happened, yes. whether uh, meditating or praying or fasting or whatever precipitated it. You, the utility of that practice may then be easily demonstrated by just noticing changes in your experience. So it's not that that experience is of, of no value in considering you know, what is worth paying attention to and how you want to live. It's just that the idea that among the reasons for believing something to be true is how that truth makes you feel, that is something which science ruthlessly and quite appropriately dissects out of the truth-gathering enterprise. True. Whereas religion makes a virtue of that very delusional mechanism where I'm seeing the, the universe the way I'm seeing it because I want it to be that way. I wouldn't want to live in a universe where there was no God. Oh my goodness, that's almost a paraphrase of Thomas Nagel's statement. I don't 
It's not just that I don't believe in God. I don't want God to exist. I don't want to live in a universe like that. The points they're making cut both ways. And in the same way, uh, your desire for feelings of autonomy and, and independence and being the captain of your soul and all that doesn't do anything to show that atheism is true. He gives an illustration here of a, a diamond in the backyard, this, uh, in your backyard the size of a refrigerator. I wouldn't want to live in a universe where I'm not going to be reunited with my loved ones in an afterlife. And that makes sense to people. In terms of the public communication of science, it seems to me that that, that fundamental reasoning error is something that has to be illuminated again and again. Only religion gets to play by those rules, and this then migrates into the rest of culture where we have people you know, opposing gay marriage. Why? Because their faith tells them that marriage is between a man and a woman, and that's the only argument they ever feel uh, required to give. And this is a point I made in, in the end of faith. If your neighbor said he believed he had a diamond in his backyard that was the size of a refrigerator and he spends every Sunday digging for it, you would never accept as a a sane reason for this behavior, that this gives his life meaning, or that he, he wouldn't want to live in a universe where there wasn't a diamond in his backyard the size of a refrigerator. I just don't understand that attitude. It's not so hard. Do you understand that illustration? What do you make of that illustration, Bill? I don't think it's interesting. Okay. Um, I, I don't care to comment on it. hard to see that people can go wrong when they take to be true okay. what they want to be true. I mean, we face this every day, but it's only religion where we actually have respect for that <laughs> as opposed yeah. to thinking that it's nuts. I personally don't get it, and I'm, I guess a lot of people don't, but there's something about religion, I, I don't know what it is, that leads to this double standard on so many levels. And the last chapter of my book is about sort of this. I mean, what's the harm in thinking that science and religion are compatible, or that faith and reason are compatible? It's because faith no, wait. leads you in. Do you see how the, how the ground has shifted here? What we were originally talking about was what's the harm in seeing that science and religion are overlapping domains? That's what they were attacking, the view that they're non-overlapping domains. But now they're saying what's the harm in thinking that there's no conflict? That's very different and they haven't demonstrated yet that there is inherently a conflict even if we agree with them that there are areas of overlap. The alleys were it's not necessarily good for society because religion is wedded to a code of conduct as well as a system of personal beliefs. And that code of conduct plays out in the public sphere with laws against gay marriage, the sort of invidious behavior of the Catholic Church towards AIDS. Also, you know, I call that horizontal pollution and there's vertical pollution whereby everybody thinks they have the right to indoctrinate the kids, their own kids into their own personal truths about the universe. So it never stops. So. One other problem you and I have run into is we meet people who deny that Islam plays any role in manufacturing the phenomenon of jihadism and Islamic terrorism. And most frustratingly, we see someone like Ayan Hirsi Ali treated terribly by people on the political left mm -hmm. and attacked by liberal, quote, feminists. Uh, and not recognized to be the feminist icon she really should be championed mm -hmm. as. And so I, I, you and I both reacted to some of the derision she received when she published her new book, Heretic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just wanted to get your, your thoughts on that phenomenon. Why, why is someone like Ayan not seen to be a true champion of uh, the emancipation of, of women in the development. Um, that is a puzzling problem. I mean, one would think that she would be, given her horrible background, her mistreatment by Muslims, the fact that she's a woman of color, the fact that she's a woman, um, that she would be that feminist icon, and yet she's vilified by the left. Um, I think it's the ultimate reason. They'll use a lot of other reasons. I mean, they have excuses. We'll go into those in a minute. It's because she's going after Islam. And Islam is off limits these days to the left. It's okay to make fun of the Jews. What's the uh, institute? Oh, Amnesty International. Sorry, they just uh, they just turned down a resolution to condemn anti-Semitic acts in Great Britain. It was they just had their international meeting. They voted every resolution up except for the one that said we condemn anti-Semitism in Great Britain. We should investigate the problem. That was voted down by Amnesty International. Now, if that had been Muslims, wow. 
That would, I mean, there would have been no problem. That act would have sailed through. It's basically, it's the kind of world now where it's okay to be anti-Semitic in, in the left, at least for many people, but not to be anti-Muslim because, and, and you know this as well as I do, Sam, Muslims are perceived as oppressed people, right? Bill, this is really fascinating here. Just as political commentary, they're taking on their own camp, the you know, liberal, the left, and saying that um, uh, despite 9-11, despite everything else in the world and, and, uh, and the jihadists, the Taliban, the, the horrible things that are going on, that uh, Muslims are still seen as oppressed mm -hmm. by the I left. I think that most of this interview, apart from the snide jabs at incompatibility of religion and science is aimed at their own camp, at people who are agnostic or atheistic but afraid to criticize religion and are willing to let religion run its course because they think it's irrelevant and doesn't impact people at all. And so really most of this interview is something that we would largely agree with. It's the sort of offhand remarks that are made all the way through that one disagrees with, particularly the double standard whereby they will criticize religious belief but fail to apply that same critique to atheistic belief. And here's CLE because she is so vociferous in criticizing Islam, and rightfully so, I think, has to be silenced. And they'll use any excuse to do that. I mean, there's these nominal excuses like the statement she made in her speech at the American Atheist Convention that American gays, the worst that can happen to them is they can't buy a cake, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, under Islam, gays get killed. But she said a lot more than that. They pick out these sound bites and use them against her. On my website, she's been criticized for being married to a conservative. <laughs> I don't understand right. what that has to do with her because she worked for a conservative think tank. I don't think she does anymore, but that was the only group that would hire her. <laughs> She talks about that in one of her books. So once they've decided to demonize her, and I think it's because she's going after Islam, ultimately, then they can find any number of excuses why this woman should be reviled and mocked and stuff. But ultimately, I think Islam, and you know this as well as I do, is sort of off limits now as a subject of criticism for the left. And it's because we have this tension between our historical hatred of oppression and yet we see in a group that is considered oppressed trying to remove the enlightenment values that the left also stands for. So that seems to be getting resolved in favor of respect for Islam. It's fascinating which wins the tug of war there, because it is true that a respect for religion is trumping a concern for the human rights of women and gays and intellectuals and free thinkers throughout the world. This is true even among irreligious people. I mean, the, another data point for me is the brain of Nicholas Kristof, the New York Times columnist, who mm -hmm. his whole thing is a concern for the rights of women, or ostensibly his whole thing is that, and yet uh, when he turns the his moral genius upon Ayan Hirsi Ali, he takes the wrong side of every issue. He actually denigrates her as, as a bigot. It really is it's just lacerating to see. Fortunately. You know, one of the interesting things here is we hear these two affirming enlightenment values and human rights. And I wonder to myself, where do those come from? Are those established scientifically? No. I look at the debate that I had with Sam Harris at Notre Dame on is the foundation of moral values, natural or supernatural. And I think you'll see the vacuity, frankly, of a naturalistic attempt to establish these enlightenment values that these fellows want to hold dear. This is a great example of inconsistency, I think, on their part. There are some what I would call right-thinking people that, you know, we're not alone. No. <laughs> That's for yeah. sure. I mean, most of the people read my website, um, know that enlightenment values should trump respect for a religion that damns those values. And you can always ask these people, well, you know, if you really think that Islam is such a great system of values, would you prefer to live in America or in Saudi Arabia or in Yemen? <laughs> and, and especially if you're a woman, I mean, I don't think there's any question about which way those people would answer. Yeah. And I find it all very puzzling. A few of those conversations I have said to my interlocutor, 
I actually think what you're saying about Islam and about multiculturalism is probably true, and so I'm just wondering what you think about my current plan to send my six-year-old daughter to live with a Taliban family for a couple of years to get to, you know, to, to get a closer appreciation of their culture. And it's, I mean, no one with a straight face can say, well, that is you know, responsible parenting on, on my side. And yet it's implicit in their view that there is nothing wrong with radical diversity of attitudes towards the treatment of women and girls. And that's part of the whole left dilemma. Um, besides the oppressed, it's a respect for multiculturalism. I mean, you weren't probably, I mean, I guess you were alive in the 60s, but you weren't you know, old enough to remember it. But I mean, multiculturalism was the watchword back then. Everybody was to be respected. We really gained from every culture. And I think that the bad parts of that view, because I'm a big view of multiculturalism in terms of music mm -hmm. and food and, you know, ways of looking at the world. But in terms of how you treat other people, especially women and minorities and how you run a society. I don't respect any culture that violates what I see as the right way to believe in. Unfortunately... Okay, uh, again, do you notice again and again and again the uh, enunciation of moral judgments on Coyne's part about the right way to behave, enlightenment values, the rights of women, uh, and, and so forth. And I, I just wonder, where does he get these values? Uh, uh, given his scientism, um, does he think there is an objective realm of moral values that are not mere human conventions, the spin-offs of um, biology and social conditioning? Um, are these just conventional, or are they objective? And if they are objective, how does he know them? Uh, these are really difficult questions for someone who holds to the kind of scientism that we've heard enunciated earlier in this interview. What did you think about his statement that religion is in opposition to enlightenment values? Well, I think that enlightenment humanism is parasitic upon Western Christianity. Where do you think the enlightenment got its values? They, they came from the Christian worldview that emphasized the worth and value of every human being created in the image of God and therefore a person of intrinsic moral value. Now sadly the Christian church did not always act consistently with its ethic but it had the right ethic and enlightenment humanism is parasitic upon Western Christianity. You don't find humanistic values in Buddhism or Marxism or, or these worldviews that, that reject um, the, the kind of grounding that you have in Christianity and theism. Multiculturalism is endemic in certain quarters of the left right now, and that goes along with the uh, hatred of oppression, which is expressed through respecting Islam. Well, so that, then what do you do with the counter-argument that one occasionally hears that suggests that religious sensitivity should trump our concern for freedom of speech because our free exercise of our speech is causing so much pain uh, in the minds of religious demagogues. So when we cartoon about the Prophet Muhammad, this causes real harm in the Muslim community, even though it's even though it's harm that we can't understand, but nevertheless, you have people who feel wronged in a very deep sense. And why shouldn't that perception of being wronged trump our concern about free speech? Well, I think Hitchens, you know, in his famous "fire, fire, fire" speech, gave the, re the response to that, which is, "Who decides? You know, what's offensive or not?" I could be offended if somebody criticized Israel and called them anti-Semites. You know, I have a Jewish background, I'm not a believer, but you know, I do get offended when I see people demonize Israel and leave Hamas alone, but I don't tell them to shut up. You know, once you get into the game of anybody whose feelings are hurt has a right to shut the other side up, then that leads to a situation in which everybody shuts up. Mm -hmm. And that's not good for society. I'm a big fan of untrammeled free speech. I think it should go. The only limits to free speech are the ones that the United States recognizes, I think, except on college campuses, which are that, you know, the only speech that should not be allowed is speech which is meant to incite violence and rioting on the spot. Mm -hmm.
know, that doesn't count making cartoons or anything like that. I'm in favor of allowing the Nazis to march through Skokie as they did. This whole wave of hurt feeling stuff, if we keep catering to that, it's a road to totalitarianism and censorship of everything because everybody can be offended. And once you learn the lesson that Islam is teaching us now, which is if you protest that you're personally offended when somebody says something you don't like, and maybe if you riot and kill, you will win. Other people are going to learn that lesson and do the same thing. And then what kind of society do we have then? America is still the land of the free in terms of species concerned, and I'd much prefer to keep things the way they are here. It's unfortunate, by the way, that college campuses seem to be the one place in this country where free speech is not greatly respected or practiced. Have you noticed a change in the culture on, on college campuses yourself? Oh, yes, yes. Even here at the University of Chicago, I, I put some of that up on my website. There was the, the woman, I can't remember her name, who was worked with Charlie Hebdo and survived the massacre, came here and talked. And she, by the virtue of her talking, she offended a number of students, Muslim students, but also their sympathizers. And there were letters to the newspaper about how she shouldn't have been allowed to speak without somebody at least balancing her viewpoint. And that happens on my very own campus. I don't really write about it because there's no <laughs> advantage to bucking the wave of student sentiment. But I, I, I want to say something here, Bill, that uh, this has really been proven to be true. And, and not only are you going to be uh, very offended not only are some students going to be very offended by even the presence of a speech or a lecturer, but you will get shouted down uh, yeah. on college campuses. Yeah. Coyne is absolutely right about what he's saying here. And if he thinks Islam is a good example of these hurt feelings, stifling free speech, he ought to see what happens to someone who speaks out against uh, same-sex marriage or homosexual activity. Uh, I have been um, precluded from speaking on certain college university campuses in Canada because I have opposed uh, same-sex marriage and said that I think that homosexual behavior is immoral. And that is not politically correct and and, and therefore um, actually, I, I won't say banned, but um, prevented from speaking on certain university campuses. I do deplore this trend. And I think Chicago is a lot better than some places like Columbia or Stanford or um, even Berkeley these days, which is odd because Berkeley is where the free speech movement began. Yeah, but it's, it skews so far left that you, you would expect that this political correctness and uh, victimology would be uh, peaking there, I would yeah. think. Yeah, it's interesting that the, you know, the left has really come full circle to the right, but now you know people like you and I are in league in some ways with Bill O'Reilly and the Fox News commenters that condemn Islam. I hate that. I hate it, to, you know, to have to voice mm -hmm. some of the same sentiments. I mean, we do it for different reasons, I think, or I would hope, but it doesn't feel good to be in bed with people whose ideology is so completely opposed to yours. And that's what, you know, the, that's what these students are becoming, basically, is right-wingers. I like the way Coyne puts it about coming full circle. I remember very well in my high school civics class, the teacher saying that the continuum between left and right is not a line, it's a circle, and that the extreme left and the extreme right actually approach each other, and he was comparing Nazism and communism. Nazis and communists hated each other. You know how Hitler uh, blamed the, the communists for uh, the burning of the Reichstag and things of that sort in Germany. They were bitter, bitter enemies, and yet they were equally oppressive, tyrannical, dictatorial systems of government that were actually very close to each other, even though the one was extreme left, the other extreme right. So it's really a kind of circle here. And you do have these leftists on the college campuses now that are very illiberal and um, 
stifling of, of spree, free speech, even though they claim to be representatives of the forces of tolerance and uh, liberality. It's crazy. It really, it's, it's, it's almost schizophrenic. Yeah, very strange. Well, I see we're, we're coming up on an hour here, Jerry, and I, I want to respect your time, but I, I want to touch one other <laughs> issue, which I don't think uh, arises in the, in the current book, but it's an issue that you and I have both sounded off on, and much to the consternation of our mutual friend Dan Dennett, the issue of free will and whether it <laughs> makes sense scientifically or philosophically. To my continued surprise, the, the topic of free will is incredibly interesting to people, and in some cases unnerving to them when, when you begin to deny it, its existence and it's a mm -hmm. it's something that really goes to the core of what they find relevant philosophically and scientifically. So I, tell me what you think about the notion of free will and or its uh, illusoriness in scientific terms. You know, that's a big question. I'm going to give a talk about this for the first time at the Imagine New Religion meetings in Vancouver in June, but um, first, you have to define free will, if you want to talk about it. And my definition is basically that you have free will if your decisions are reflect anything more than the laws of physics that impinge on your mind, as reflected through your genetic endowment and the environments you've experienced. In, in other words, I consider free will as a form of dualistic free will. <laughs> And um, that I reject. So I'm a determinist. I basically believe, and I think you agree with me because I've read your book, that at any one point in time, it's completely the configuration of molecules in the universe, and in particular in your brain, that mandates what you do and that you could not have done anything other than you did. In other words, you couldn't, you don't have any choices. You know, you think you do and it looks like you do, but you don't really. And so I'm a determinist in that sense. It's very difficult for me to understand how they can espouse determinism and yet at the same time make these assertions condemning uh, those who would abridge freedom of speech, those who are overly sensitive to Muslim claims, those who don't espouse liberal values, someone who believes in religion um, or someone who would send his daughter to live with the Taliban if everything you do, do is determined by the laws of physics and you have no choice to do otherwise. I, I simply can't understand how they can make these sorts of judgments, these judgmental statements, consistently with their deterministic view. And so are people like Dan Dennett who nevertheless maintain there is free will. They do that by a semantic trick by redefining what free will is, and you know those tricks. They're called compatibilists. Um, my view is that it's purely a semantic game, that those people do it largely because, for what you said, that the notion of that we don't have free will, that we're more or less wet robots, is frightening to people. <laughs> it's as frightening as the idea that we're going to die. Um, now, we have to accept death because we see it all around us, but it's harder for people to accept that your brains are reflecting the laws of physics. I think one of the unanswered difficulties for determinism isn't simply that it's unpalatable, but that it's rationally unaffirmable. I, I do not understand how a determinist can think that his belief in determinism is a rational belief um, because he simply determined to believe it. His believing in determinism is like his having a toothache or a tree growing a branch out of one side. It's just determined by the laws of physics. And so it's not a result of rationally reflecting on the issue, weighing the arguments pro and con, and, and making it a decision. It, you're simply determined by the laws of physics to believe it. So it's difficult for me to see how they can think that determinism could ever be rationally justified to believe. And so they reject it. Even Steven Weinberg at the um, naturalist meetings in Stockbridge a couple years ago is a physicist, a determinist, and an atheist would not accept the fact that he could not have decided otherwise in any given moment. So if somebody as smart as that finds free will so appealing that they'll believe it regardless of all the evidence, then you can see how seductive a notion that really is. It's interesting. I, I now notice an unhappy analogy and uh, 
really symmetry between the compatibilism versus our version of determinism on the one hand and accommodationism, which we've been talking about for an hour, and the recognition that there is a zero-sum contest between faith and reason or religion and science. Right. Uh, there is a, they, they have a non-overlapping <laughs> magisteria idea. That's right. I see, I see people like, and let me say, because Dan's going to hear this probably, and so let me say, Dan, I love you and I'd hug you if you were here, but I don't agree with your views on compatibilism at all. I think that compatibilists who redefine free will to mean things like Free will means doing something without a gun to your head <laughs> or without being locked in prison or mm. various, or that humans are complex and so we have a lot more inputs that go into our outputs since that constitutes the redefinition of free will. It's a lot like theology, first in several respects. First of all, because they redefine something, which is free will. In the case of theologians, it's God, so <laughs> that it is palatable to people, it doesn't disturb them so much. They're immune to challenges. It's basically a semantic game. Um, they play the same game, and, and they do it like theologians because they think that society that doesn't believe in free will is going to run amok. I mean, people have said this explicitly. Dan said it. Uh, Eddie Namias, I'm not sure that's how you pronounce his name, has said it. Mm. Um, they think that if we realize that we're, our behaviors are really determined, we're going to become either nihilists or criminals. <laughs> It's odd that Dan says this because he criticizes belief in belief. It is the belief that religion is good for other people, if not for you. For the, on the same grounds that without believing in religion, people are going to run amok or they be nihilists. There's a sort of asymmetry there. It's not true, of course. I mean, I, I don't yeah. believe in free will, neither do you. And I think we're, we consider ourselves upstanding people. To me, the real important issue is not how you define free will. It's the issue of determinism which is the really important one. And every philosopher, practically, is a determinist. They know you could not behave other than you do at any one time. And yet some people will say, well, that's still OK. We have a form of free will. I think, as you say in your book, that we're, that's, you could construe that as saying we're puppets that love our strings. So th there are some aspects of this that I find surprising when I've tried to unpack what I think are the moral implications of believing what we believe about determinism and therefore uh, a, per a person's ability to do other than, than what they do. And one thing is that I was considering you know, what a person's actions says about him. And uh, the, the example I used, I think this was in pushing back against Dan Dennett's uh, review of my book, Free Will. Uh, the, ex the example he gave uh, based on the work of the philosopher uh, Austin was of a missed putt. So you have someone, you have a golfer who's three feet from the hole and he tries to make his putt and he misses it and the idea that he could not do otherwise because you know the universe was in precisely the configuration it was mm -hmm. including every you know charge in his nervous system that doesn't tell you anything of interest about what sort of golfer he is what you want and this is Dan's arguing uh, against me now mm -hmm. what you want to know is just the, what he would do in general in that circumstance that's that's how you understand his responsibility as a golfer and his, his likely future behavior and that's fine uh, as far as I'm concerned it's, it's true that you want to be able to generalize over many similar instances though different in their microstructure what a golfer is capable of but one thing I found interesting when I thought about this example is that when you take a golfer like Tiger Woods and he misses a three-foot putt and given the, the reality of determinism he would miss that putt a trillion times in a row Mm -hmm. Whatever went wrong went wrong, and it would keep going wrong every time you rewind the universe to its exact state. It reveals that there are two things you, ha you seem to have to hold in mind at the same time. One is, if anyone should have made that putt, it's Tiger Woods. I mean, he, is, he is more responsible in the conventional sense of responsibility mm -hmm. for missing that putt than any other golfer. Certainly, he's more responsible than I would be because I'm the kind of golfer who misses putts of that length all the time. So we, we expected him to, to make it, he missed it, and therefore the opprobrium attached to that error should be highest in his case. Okay. So on the one Here, Harris is equivocating on the word should. He did this in the debate that I had with him as well. This is not a moral should when we say Tiger Wood should have made that putt. What he's talking about there is given the abilities and the skill 
of Tiger Woods. Um, he, that putt should have gone in the hole. But this is not a moral responsibility. It's more like saying, given that you had this highly articulated and um, calculated machine that pushes balls, that the, the, the ball should have gone in the hole, given that highly articulated and you know, calculated machine. Uh, but it, it, it didn't. It, it missed. But that doesn't make the machine morally responsible. And that's the issue here, is that if there is no free will, if people are determined to do whatever they do, then how can they be held any more morally responsible than if a machine did it? Because on Coyne's view, we are machines. We are moist robots, as he puts it. And robots are not moral agents. So I think that their determinism undermines all of these judgments that we have heard throughout this interview, condemning people who uh, have religious beliefs, condemning those who persecute in the name of religion, uh, condemning those who deny enlightenment values and so forth. All of these moral judgments are vacuous, it seems to me, given the fact that we are just machines. It gets better. Oh. On one hand, it's a greater failure for him because he really should have made it. But on the other, his missing it says the least about him because he's going to make that putt 900 times in a row. It's just I don't actually have yes. a, a strong conclusion based on that, but it seems kind of a paradox where the, the, the closer you get to this notion of responsibility in the micro instance of, of something happening, the, the more it seems undeserved. Yeah, especially there. And you've got to wonder, I mean, what is the use of a program to somebody like Tiger Woods anyway, criticizing him because he missed the putt? Is that going to make him a better golfer or not? Or is that just some instinctive feeling we have? I mean, all this, I mean, that argument to me just finesses the whole really important issue of moral responsibility. I mean, I don't think we have moral responsibility, but I think. Wait a minute. Does he really think that we don't have moral responsibility? He's incredibly candid, isn't he? But I wonder, Kevin, doesn't this illustrate the sorts of confirmation bias and inconsistencies that he denounced in religious people who hold to certain views that are incompatible with uh, the way the world really is? I mean, here's a man who thinks that we're moist robots and everything we do is determined and that there is no moral responsibility, and yet who is morally indignant about uh, numerous things throughout the entire universe. He seems to exemplify the sort of incompatibility that he so detests in religious people. We have responsibility in a way that has to be adjudicated in society through a program and punishment. And this is what bothers me about all of these compatibilists and people who talk about free will because they're all determinists and instead of concentrating on the really important issue for society which is that we could not behave other than we do and one of the implications of that for our system of punishment and reward they play a semantic game they engage in well you know if maybe you know some yiddish they engage in pill pool just endless debate about how these hypotheticals and examples about how we could construe free will or not when the real issue is what do we do about the criminal justice system? How do we deal with people that transgress and are dangerous to society, N knowing now that that's right. the only thing they could right. have done? You know, it seems to me that philosopher, the real problem for society is the problem of determinism, which everybody accepts, but which people like compatibilists ignore. And I don't. I want to. I want to stop there, Bill. Uh, he says everybody accepts determinism. Not all philosophers. No, accept. of course not. There are plenty of philosophers today who are libertarians and would disagree with compatibilists as well as determinists. Understand why they prefer to play these semantic games than deal with the one thing that we all agree on, which is that we could not do otherwise than what we do. Right. And, and just to be clear here, to, to say that we could not do otherwise is not to say that certain punishments don't deter certain classes of crime or that people can't learn to behave better than they, than they have in the past or that, you know, that rehabilitation of certain criminals is possible or not or the cure of certain 
psychological problems as possible or not. I mean, these are, it still matters what a person does or has done to him, and people can be discouraged successfully in many cases from misbehaving based on the kinds of laws we enact and the kinds of punishments uh, we lay down for them. But it's not, in any specific instance, uh, a person does exactly what he in fact does based on a concatenation of causes that precede his agency. His agency is just an expression of everything that has made him what he is in that moment. And we, we recognize that when, in, in specific cases where you, know, you find a brain tumor in, in, the, in the brain of some criminal that is in the right place to have influenced his behavior, then you think, well, as in the case of Charles Whitman, mm -hmm. this, is, this person was unlucky. Where Two things there, real quick, Bill. Um, first of all, uh, he talks about how uh, we as a society, even though everything's determined, even though that, that person couldn't have done otherwise, there are certain things that we can do to deter that uh, almost uh, a behavior modification. We need to engage sure. behavior, B.F. Skinner behavior modification. What we can uh, do is reprogram the robots, or we can restring the marionettes so as to make them behave differently. Uh, their morality has gone completely out the window here. It's just a matter of um, making the machines function in a different way. And what if somebody quite insidious, maybe a Hitler or a Stalin got in charge of the system that could behaviorally modify everybody? Well, and, uh, I think on their uh, view, you'd, I, I don't see how you could say that he did anything wrong to do that. I, I, I don't see how you could condemn him for doing something like that. And then you have Charles Whitman, who climbed up in the uh, UT Tower, University of Texas, in, with a rifle and shot people there on campus in, uh, I believe, the 60s. Uh, largely thought to be due to a brain tumor, and they're saying that he could not have done otherwise. So they're bringing up this moral dilemma here. Whereas you don't find a brain tumor, but you have, have the bewildering complexity of neurophysiology as yet ununderstood. That, that is, as I've argued elsewhere, just a, a glorified brain tumor in that case. It's just that, that is just as causal uh, in his case but that doesn't mean that if people are responsive to certain punishments, we can't, we can't use punishments to get them to respond in certain ways. If, you can, if a behavior is voluntary, the, the nature of its being voluntary is that it, it can be discouraged by punishments. If you're going to fine me $1,000 every time I stay you know, five minutes too long at a parking meter, I will, I will change my <laughs> relationship to parking meters. Yeah, I don't understand. I mean, this is the greatest misconception we have about determinism amongst the public is that you can't, if determinism is true, you can't influence people's behavior by your behavior. I mean, that's probably false. And I always use the example, if you kick a dog every time it comes near you, it's going to stop coming near you. That, you know, I mean, the dog learns and people can learn. I actually say the same thing you do, that all criminals, in a sense, have brain tumors. But you can't say anything that will piss people off more than saying that. It's, it has, people have a visceral reaction to that. Because their sense of agency is so great, they can't believe that they have the mental equivalent of a brain tumor if they do something wrong. But you know, I think it's worth mentioning here, Kevin, that that is the reason I think that people do believe in free will is because they do have a sense of, of their agency. own personal agency, and I know that more intimately and more immediately than virtually anything else that I know. So it would take overwhelming evidence to make you give up belief in your own personal agency. And Harris himself says that the neural system is so complex that we can't understand it. So how does he know then that determinism is true and that, and that we don't have this kind of agency? I, I, uh, I can see why people would be very skeptical of this determinism, not only because of the objections that I mentioned to it, but also because of the tremendous warrant that I have for thinking that I have free will, namely my own personal agency. Anybody that knows anything about the laws of physics knows that that is true. I mean, what I like about determinism and why I think people like Dan should be really talking about that rather than just playing the semantic game is because it puts the whole system of punishment rewards, especially 
criminal punishment and rewards on, on a scientific basis. I mean, now we can figure out, okay, how do we re rehabilitate somebody? What are the actions that we can take that will affect somebody in such a way that they aren't recidivists? <laughs> or how long is it, do we need to put somebody away before it will reform them? Um, so we, can, we still can have punishment for deterrence to sequester people from society and for reformation. But now we can investigate scientifically what are the best ways to intercede to do that. And we can do all that without saying these people are bad, with, that they're morally responsible, which I don't think they are. The only thing we get rid of is what we don't want anyway, which is punishment out of vindictiveness, punishment yeah. for retribution. <laughs> we don't, nobody likes that. You know, no enlightened person likes that. And that's the one thing that automatically goes away when you start believing that free will is an illusion. Yeah, well, obviously, this is a very uh, deep and interesting area, which could probably merit its own hour, but... Um, yeah, you're not going to find many people that, that have the same views as we do about this, but I, mean, I think that they're the correct views because they stem directly from the laws of physics. I mean, that trumps everything else, and uh, the rest is commentary. <laughs> yeah, but in this case, I, I think it's, it's actually helpful that... Could I, I... I would like to say something here. If you want to see some of the outworkings of this view that the laws of physics trump everything, I want to recommend our listeners watch my debate with Alex Rosenberg on uh, is there evidence for the existence of God? Because Rosenberg, like Coyne and Harris, is a physicalist who believes that the laws of physics trump everything and determine everything. And watch that debate and look at the conclusions to which he as a naturalist feels forced. I think they will shock you. The well, implications are, at least in, in my view, benign uh, or, or positive. It's not that you suddenly uh, wind up in a world you don't want to live in when you follow these, the, the message of these physical truths to the, to the end. It's, uh, I think it's, it improves, as you say, our approach to fundamental ethical questions yeah. and I mean it's, it's conceivable that there are certain truths that we wouldn't want to know things that are if known would reliably degrade our our well-being our, our ability to get what we want out of life but I, this certainly does not seem one of them and that and that seems to be Dan's fear at least in half his moods when he when he talks about this yeah and there's one other thing which just struck me the other day when I was thinking about an old girlfriend I had and feeling regrets and all of a sudden like intellect kicked in, and I said, well, you know, what happened, happened. There was no choice about the matter. Why should I feel any regret? Why should I wish that things had turned out differently? They could. No. <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> and we don't know what Coyne did in the relationship with the girlfriend, but suppose he was abusive. Suppose he raped her and, and, and beat her. Uh, suppose he treated her with, with violence and so forth. Uh, no regrets. You were, he was determined to do it anyway. I mean, this is, this is a view which is not merely unpatable. This is a view which would require enormous evidence if you're to embrace it over your belief in personal agency and moral responsibility, which this view denies. Uh, and, and I simply don't see any reason to think that such a view is true. Yeah. Or even if it were something lesser, like you lied to her or something. You mean you don't have any regrets? You wish you hadn't done that? Uh, I, I just can't. Uh, it's really fathom. shocking. Not have turned out differently. So there are personal positive things, too. And the fact is our sense of agency is with us. I don't know how it evolved or why it's there, but it's not going to turn us into automatons to simply recognize that we're governed by the laws of physics because um, we do have this powerful illusion. And there are personal and societal benefits from at least addressing that illusion and seeing why it's an illusion, as you do in your book. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I mean, just to go one epiphany further, uh, I don't actually have the illusion when I pay attention. I mean, for me, a moment of you know, what I would call mindfulness mm -hmm. or meditation is synonymous with just noticing that everything arises on its own, including thoughts and intentions and preferences and fears, it was just, everything is just springing into view, whether it's a matter of just the phenomenology of my own mental life or things, perceptual experiences that I notice in the world or my perceptions of the world. 
Uh, so I, just as I can't pick the next thing I hear, because a, you know, the, sound, the next sound simply impinges on my eardrum, I can't pick the next thing I think. Mm -hmm. The next thought just appears. So how is that a basis for free will? Yes. It, 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 it doesn't, you know, I mean, that, that, that's not to deny that my thoughts follow a certain predictable pattern. I can tell you with some certainty that I won't start thinking in Korean you know, five minutes mm -hmm. from now because I don't understand a word of it. And the kinds of things I think about, like my wife or my book, that's all that's predictable. But in each, in the micro instance, the next thing that springs into view simply springs into view. And, and that, the irony for me is that close attention to our mental life doesn't give us this basis for free will either. It's a, most people think that there's a there's this very strong experience of free will that we, that we just can't figure out how to square with reality. But if you look closely, I, you know, I would argue you, the experience itself begins to break apart. And again, it's breaking apart is not harmful to you. Yeah, that's a level of spiritual advancement I haven't <laughs> attained yet. I agree with you completely. I'm just wondering if this is just a personal question. So do you live on two planes at once then? When you go into a restaurant and you order a steak, are you thinking about your thinking about ordering the steak when you do that? I mean, you're aware that this piece of meat floats into your mind and, um, you know, wondering where it came from or... Because that seems a very different way of living than most people do. It's not so much... A, it's not a matter of thinking about the, the origins of of impulses and intentions, it's just noticing mm -hmm. that that one thing arises or doesn't in a way that that I can't account for. That I I being you know the conscious witness of of my experience can't account for. Mm -hmm. So it's, so on, on certain occasions a desire for steak will will arise and on others it won't, and I am motivated precisely to the, to the degree that I am and no further to resist it or to indulge it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, there's a fundamental mystery of why anything happens as it does in any instance. But it is not a matter of adding more thinking to the experience. It's just a matter mm -hmm. of, of just noticing that in this instance, a desire for one food as opposed to another is arising. And uh, if you asked me why uh, that was the case, I, the honest answer is, I don't know. And it, in every case. Well, no, I mean, not in every case, right? <laughs> Just to pursue this a bit further, because you could do, you could actually think about it. When you say, I want a steak, then you can think, well, why do I want a steak? Because I haven't had a steak in three days, you know? <laughs> or, or I feel bitten to prod, you know? You can review the influences on your your mind and mm -hmm. um, make some plausible, in many cases, a, plaus a plausible guess as to why you have been influenced the way you have. So it's, I could just seen a commercial for steak and when I walk into the restaurant an hour later I can consciously recall that commercial and how I want to say something here about this bill this this seems to kind of undermine determinism as well because uh, uh, Sam Harris still says I can review these influences and pick and choose what's going to influence me or I can observe these influences happening and uh, this, this sense of I, this sense of agency, and then uh, make it a determine why I, uh, determination why I acted like I did or why I wanted steak today and things yeah. like this. So, there does seem uh, to be that so-called transcendental ego that is never fully objectified, yeah. that stands above the train of experiences and surveys them and judges them. And to his credit, he said, I, you know, I don't understand that sense of consciousness, but he still denies it. Yeah. But it's, he's still really acknowledging this agency that can observe, that can uh, review, and, uh, and all these other things, uh, uh, the input that is coming in, so to speak. So, well, well Bill, we, we ran the gamut in this series of podcasts uh, here, I have to say that I, I, I know that these will be very influential. Uh, these two men are very influential, in, uh, in particular in the uh, internet infidel uh, type uh, community and the atheist community, and so we can expect to see repercussions of this interview, I think, for some time. Any final thoughts on some of the things we've heard? 
I would say, summing up, that much of the interview did not discuss the alleged reasons or evidence for which they think that science is incompatible with certain Christian beliefs about the world. They, they simply assumed that. That wasn't the subject of the interview. The subject of the interview was, by and large, a critique of this accommodationist view, which we don't hold to, the view that science and religion don't overlap. And in the course of the interview, there were a lot of assumptions and side remarks and insinuations made with which one would disagree, and those were worth highlighting. But the overall point uh, that accommodationism is not a, a view that a, a Christian theologian should adopt, I think, is one with which we would concur.